I was really interested in carving out a niche for myself. You know, one of the real challenges for being a reporter is how do you establish an identity, something that is basically your own. And one really interesting fact is most media publications, you think about how they actually list video, video games, they don't put them in italics, they don't put them in quotation marks. And that's like a small style distinction, but that's how they're saying that video games are not an art form, it's a product, right? It's just it's just something, it's like a Toyota Prius, there's no like art to actually making it. Um, and video games are the only kind of artistic medium that are treated that way. What I feel like video games lack is a vernacular. There isn't a native tongue for all who play games that they can converse in openly. Not just people who are like hardcore gamers, but like everybody, right? Um, and I feel like this lack of common narrative culture really scares me because What's happening is, and this has really been aided by things like the iPad, is that we're moving out of a world where people ask, uh, are you a game player? And we're moving into a world where people ask, what games do you play? There's a great writer, Tom Bissell. He wrote a book called Extra Lives. He's a good friend of mine, and in the book he talks about his experiences, and he says, so what have games given me? And he says, experiences. Not surrogate experiences, but actual experiences, many of which are as important to me as any real memories. I think that's one of the misperceptions that we have about games is that when you something happens to you, like you lose a, great, you lose a game of StarCraft II, is that that's somehow not real, right? That that's, oh, that's something that happened in this other virtual universe and that the, emotion, the, the emotions that it evoked, those are just like, those are proxies, those are not actual real things. I heard a great story uh, from a friend of mine about a young man who was going to marry a girl from, uh, from Hong Kong and his future father-in-law did not speak any English. And so they're like, all right, so why don't we play a game of Mahjong? Even though they don't share a common language, they do, they do have the ability to understand more about each other through playing games. Um, sometimes we're more ourselves when we play games. So in a game of Mahjong, you can see, is this person vindictive? Does he follow the rules? Um, does he hold a grudge? Is he a risk taker? Is he very conservative? Those are things that are um, expressions of our personality. Even if you're not a risk taker, the fact that you're playing one says something about your personal disposition. Um, I gave a talk. Um, about two years ago for some students, uh, for, for uh, some young folks in New Haven, Connecticut, they had emotional, teenagers who had emotional disabilities and they were being uh, reacclimated to prepare them for college and high school and Call of Duty came up. Now I don't actually think that like teens should be, anyone under the age of 18 should be playing violent video games. I don't want that to be mistaken here. But we started talking about Call of Duty, so I said, all right, let's roll with it. And it was really interesting hearing the kids talk about their opinions about what was fair play in Call of Duty. Um, you know, for the kids who were snipers, it, the argument was about camping and whether or not it, that was a fair way to play Call of Duty if you're a sniper or really good at sniping, for example. Um, that seems totally fair to you, but if you're not, it totally sucks, right? And so I asked them, like, where does this sense of justice, where does this sense of fairness actually come from? And it's interesting because what they were having is a conversation about ethics. So this is a photo from the Bataan Death March, which was a big, uh, which is a big blasphemy against the Geneva Convention, which was designed specifically to answer this question, how should we fight? What's fair in war? Um, and so video games can be a great play space for, for that to happen. I think the big thing, the big inspiration for me were other publications like Monocle, which is run by the former um, head of Wallpaper. And what they do is, it's really fascinating in terms of producing a print magazine, and then they do radio, and then they do a store. And so they're really about sort of they're kind of taking it back and kind of doing an old school kind of approach to producing content. So I think it's a great way to differentiate yourself by providing a lot of options and also giving people different price points that they can engage you at. Some people don't want to pay anything, so you give them free content on the website. Some people want to pay a little bit more, you give them a magazine. I don't think we have anything above the magazine. I guess we could make something else up that's more expensive, more luxury. <laughs> <laughs> a new car. <laughs> the kill screen coupe coming 2014. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and um, has anything happened to you where you were just kind of like, wow, I didn't think Kill Screen would get me to this spot? Um, I would say throwing our one night arcade at the Museum of Modern Art last year um, was a real turning point for me and a real validation, I think, of the work that we've been doing. Um, just MoMA is an incredible place. It's a place I visited all the time. And, you know, it's the seat of modern art in the world. You know, there are a couple of modern art museums and that's one of them. If you're an artist, that's a place where you want to be. And so I think getting tremendous buy-in from them and feeling like they understood and respected games so much so that they would let them be shown to their public was just an incredible, um, yeah, it was just a, wonder, a wonderful moment, I think, for games that they would be shown in that setting alongside, you know, Warhols and a variety of other things that they host in that museum. Um, 
I never would have expected that when we got started, but I'm really happy that it happened and I'm looking forward to building more on that in the future. Definitely. And then uh, is there anything we should be looking out for specifically from Kill Screen in the near future? Uh, that's a good question. Oh, we're finishing up the change issue. Uh, so that will be out in the next two months. And then uh, there's nothing I can talk about publicly, unfortunately. <laughs> I, I, I don't want to tell you something and then like if it changes or doesn't happen, then you know, be disappointed. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't have any big reveals if that's what you're asking me, <laughs> which is ironic because I just spent all this time talking about people should talk about their process more often. <laughs> <laughs> so I apologize. Do as I say, not as I do, I suppose. <laughs>